Hi, YouTube. Um, how are you doing? Hope you're having a good um, Thursday evening. Looking forward to Christmas. So uh, we're um, we're going to get going in probably about two minutes. We're just going to wait for a few more people to to, to join, um, and and then we'll get started. And, and hopefully you'll enjoy the talk. So um, I'll be back with you in about a minute or so to intro. Sure. Um, and and then we'll get started, and, and hopefully you'll enjoy the talk. So. Right. Okay. Let's let's get started. I think um, we're, we're probably good to go. So, um, hello everybody, and welcome to this very special um, Agile roundabout. It's, it's actually our fiftieth event, and I can't quite believe how time's flown by. Um, so, the the Agile roundabout it was founded back in two thousand and sixteen as a way of giving back to the tech community and to facilitate knowledge sharing. And without speakers, past and present. And of course, you, the audience, these events wouldn't be what they are today. So we hope that you'll continue to find value in these events and that maybe they'll even inspire you to try some of the ideas mentioned today in your own place of work. So what we're going to be discussing today is we're going to be discussing the um, delivery function in particular, looking at how this uh, process and practice has evolved over the last few years. So to help delve deeper into this topic, we have three amazing talks lined up. So firstly, we're going to be hearing a joint talk from Claudia and Maria, who are delivery leads at iTech. And then we're going to be hearing from um, Rosalyn, who's head of delivery at Zoopla. And then finally, we've got James, who's a delivery manager at Discovery. So for all of you who've attended an event recently, this won't be news to you, but we've changed the, the platform. Um, so we're streaming directly onto YouTube now. So all th three um, speakers, or four in this case, uh, would love your participation and interactions. Uh, any questions that you have, please feel free to use the, the comment sections to the right of your screens, and I'm, I'm sure they'll be happy uh, to, to answer them. So just to know, um, if, if you are going to ask some questions, you'll need to log in via Google to do this. And, and finally, um, any social media, please use the hashtag Agile roundabout. So uh, I've, I've probably rambled enough and, and you're not here to, to hear me. So um, I'd like to firstly introduce Claudia and Maria, who's going to be discussing their delivery function at iTech. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to our talk. Um, this evening, we'll be kicking things off by talking about learning the language of Agile in a fast growing tech startup. So just to quickly intro ourselves, I'm Maria. I'm a senior delivery lead at iTech. I've actually been in project management for about eight years now, but I didn't actually start here. I studied journalism and wanted to be a magazine editor. So after interning for about 18 months, whilst it was a great experience, it wasn't really the reality. I actually remember my mom saying, um, when are you gonna get a real job that pays? I don't actually know what you do, but you need to start a proper job. Um, and then I stepped into project management. So my first role was at a small website agency where I soon found my love for web and software development. I then moved on to an employer brand and advertising agency. Um, and in both of these places, I wasn't actually able to work in proper agile ways of working. We said we did agile, but I don't think we really understood it. So where I was self-teaching myself all around agile practices and how to do things, it wasn't actually until iTech found me a year and a half ago where I was actually able to apply that properly, not only work in this way, but also pioneer within the company, which is amazing. And even to now, my mum still asks me, what do you do? I don't really understand. Um, but Claudia, over to you. Thanks, Maria. And I think that's something a lot of project managers find from their parents as well. Um, my background started very differently from where I am today as well. Uh, 10 years ago, I started my working career in the music industry as an event manager. The plan was never to work in an agile way, although anyone who's worked in events will know something will always go wrong and you need to fail fast, adapt, and learn quickly. So maybe it was ingrained in me from the beginning. Six years ago, I moved to London and made the switch to tech. So I've tried a few different agencies working across hospitality, e-commerce, some of the tech giants, and now gaming. It's only really been in the last two years that I've started working so closely with Agile. I've never worked for a company who take on the Agile approach quite like iTech do. And it's undoubtedly helped us to scale at a rapid rate, both in the delivery chapter and the company as a whole. 
So you're going to hear enough of us over the next 20 minutes. We thought we could set the scene on the journey of Agile in iTech with a short video. That was a nice snapshot into our journey through our company and it brings us nice into what we're going to cover for the rest of the session we're going to share our experiences working with different levels of agile and how we've evolved that within squads and tribes so just to start off we wanted to touch upon some key elements that we've actually identified these aren't the only things that are the ingredients for us but it's what we personally think are the most important that we have come across within our own teams the first being it's the thinking and the shift in the mindset that needs to happen, not only as a company, but as our teams. We need to also make sure that we're educating so that we all understand why we're doing things, what are the principles, and what that in turn will give us. And lastly, how can we relate all of this to our specific needs? You know, it's not a one size fits all. We're not a Google, we're not a Spotify, we're iTech. So it needs to be understood in our real life and where we want to get to as a company. We see all of these things going hand in hand and we'll talk through some examples later. But first, we've grouped who our key audiences are for Agile and iTech. Now, important to caveat this, these personas were created for the purpose of this talk, just to help us illustrate our journeys and they're not used to segment our squad members at all. So, meet James, he's our Agineer. He's a content editor and has never worked in an agile environment before. He hears the word scrum and he thinks we're talking about the Six Nations. He has a lot of questions and needs more support, but he's definitely willing to learn. Meet Lauren. She's our Ajitterate and has been a product manager for years. She's familiar with agile, her team uses Jira, and she has a retro at the end of a big project. She wouldn't say she's an expert, but she's comfortable that she knows enough for her role and meet Jemima. She's our edge expert and has been working in tech for multiple startups for years. She's read all the books, she's been to conferences, she's probably at Agile Roundabout right now. Jemima thinks all teams can benefit from Agile ways of working and is a true pioneer of the Agile methodology. So as our screen starts to fill now with all our different levels of Agile experiences, we're now going to kick off with starting to look at our own personal teams. So I'm going to kick things off with um, the first tribe and how we have evolved. So going back 18 months now, um, I guess starting from zero from a delivery side, um, I joined our flagship product. There were 16 of us at the time and we were the biggest team. It was not only the first time for product working with delivery, but it was also the first time that the team were able to work with someone around ways of working. There were big growth plans for us for the near future, so everyone was really excited about this, but I don't think they truly knew what to expect. Agile was a thing, but it wasn't really understood. So at this point, it was fair to say we were actually a team of Aginas. I knew Agile myself, but was yet to be in a place where I could apply it properly. And so our journey really began. When we started, we had no clear framework or processes, but our squads were working in chapters, so there were no cross-functional teams. Our engineers were working to two-week sprints, content were working to three. 
They had their stand-ups and their retrospectives, but they were all happening as chapters. So it was all a bit disconnected. This to me was an indication that they thought they were doing things in the right way and things were okay. They were doing their ceremonies. But what was the right way for us? This is what we really need to focus on. We need to bring in that education and start that shift in mindset. We had some ag experts in the team. And the reason I say this with quotation marks is because um, it wasn't because of the years of agile experience. They had read the books on Scrum and they knew about Scrum as a framework. And for us, this was commonly some of the engineers. Where they knew the theory, it was quite difficult to apply some basics, like how could we refine our ceremonies, introducing definitions of done, what were our cadences? And I had a challenge with them in accepting any change. One of the lines that kind of sticks with me now through this journey is, but in Scrum, it says you do it like this, which was quite interesting. But on the other side, there were some people that didn't care as much, and those were more of the agoners, where they just really wanted to do their work and they would follow any processes put in place as long as it meant they were delivering. But this also sparked some concern. So the first thing we did was form two cross-functional squads just to get us in the right space of mind and start thinking in the right way. One was around the growth of the product and one was around optimization. We really focused on our ways of working, understanding our workflows, working collaboratively, and really starting to think about how we could be autonomous in our squads. We were no way ready for that just yet, but it was enough to think that this could eventually be the goal. So if we fast forward a couple more months and we're now a team of 25, so we're growing really quickly. Those ad experts were soon becoming my allies. It became clear that I needed them to help cascade some of that agile thinking and practices into their squads. It was really important for us to work together and help change this mindset in real time. You can throw as much theory at teams as possible, but if it isn't applied or understood in real life, it really won't relate and it, it could fail. This was a big theme for the tribe. Yes, the textbook says that you should have daily stand-ups for about 10 minutes, but our reality at that time was that we had a new team of 11 people and our work wasn't moving fast enough, so this wasn't valuable for us. So I really wanted to make sure that all of the understanding was there, but it was completely applied to our current position before any further changes were made. We streamlined our ceremonies, we started shaping how we were planning, we refined backlogs that were the length of the River Nile, and the we here is clear. It wasn't just a delivery thing. It wasn't our product and delivery thing. It was all of us. We really encouraged the squads to be part of this and take ownership. If they wanted to have a grasp over the way they work, they need to start being part of this decision making and the creation of what the work actually looks like. Of course, this came with some teething problems. I'm sure all of you are probably nodding when I say this, but I had, it's a delivery thing. Can you create the task in JIRA? Can you move them over? Can you do this? but that's not the mindset of a maturing agile team. So we did have a bit of work to do here to build up trust and understanding about why this was important. We also at this point started to become pioneers um, for other squads in the company. We were really sharing knowledge and becoming a standard of our ways of working. The biggest challenge for us here was that we were soon to be more squads and quite quickly, where the rest of the company were behind in scaling in their squads. So at times it really did feel like it was just us. Yes, we were on a roll, we were moving fast and trying to mature quite quickly, but we were on our own. So it was quite hard to have other like squads to lean on. I remember we had an internal Spotify model training and um, the business and everyone was so excited about all the things that Spotify do and had done, you know, health checks, figures, different types of planning. Wow, tried leadership, all this really amazing stuff that everyone just kind of wanted to throw everything in. But for us, this really wasn't a good time to rock the boat. We'd only just got on a track. Even then as a company, we were actually still learning. We didn't wanna go back to where we were, where we had lots of things going on and nothing was connected. So we let the dust settle. And we did a playback of all the great things we learned to the team. But it was only when we saw opportunities appear that we needed to start looking at these in more detail. And by then it was already familiar with the squads. Health Checks was a good example of this. Because we had a lot of change, we wanted to make sure that our teams were happy. And if they weren't, really understand why and what we can do to improve, especially as we continue to grow. So we started introducing our health checks across our squads. So time is going a bit fast at this point, and we're now four squads, and we're 30 plus people. We know we needed some structure, but we also needed autonomy to help our teams become high-performing high performing squads. And they were also actually crying out for this. 
having officially became the first tribe for the company in October last year, we really started to shape. So how do we start looking at all these ways of allowing autonomy? And how do we improve our ways of working? Well, we tried. We did self-selection for the four squads and we created squad brands. We did a 360 on how we were using our tools. We restructured JIRA, giving them their own space. We introduced lots of things, but some just to mention now, story mapping, story slicing, DRIs, working agreements. We had our furry friend Elmo that we used to take into meetings to help with focus. We looked at productivity metrics and data to help us inform decisions. And as you'll see from the gift that's about to appear, it did become a little bit of a car crash. Not that any of these were wrong or not needed, but we didn't actually take the baby steps and map out the evolution of all these great practices and initiatives. I knew we needed to do them. The squads were excited we were moving into this space and could see where we were going. But what was the actual purpose? What was our bigger picture? And how are we gonna keep telling this story? So we were soon back to storming. We needed more delivery and product, and we knew that was gonna come soon. But the here and now was that we needed a delivery strategy and a roadmap to help tie everything together, to help relate it and support our product strategy. The tribe thought this was all additional work, but it actually should be part of everything we do. And that was the message that we tried to relay. We needed to be able to show that. So we actually aligned it to our roadmap, to our OKRs, and that it underpinned everything we were delivering. Then all the above seemed to suddenly ease in and stuck with the teams over the next six months, just by having a plan of how each can evolve at the right time. We also spent a lot of time defining what autonomy is for us. We had lean coffees, we were doing workshops for all of our squads, but everyone was different. Not only did we have different people, different goals in our squads and different personalities with preferred ways of working, we also had to make sure that we were working with teams in a way that we could align across the tribe. I remember one season this year, one of the squad took autonomy to another level. And when the OKRs were shared, they came back with a complete rewrite of them, which I thought was brilliant at the time because it really showed that ownership and autonomy. But it wasn't really done in the right way. It wasn't collaborative, it wasn't communicated, and it didn't create any trust. So after negotiating and making some pivots, once the first sprint has started, we really got things back on track and it really started our way of them becoming autonomous. So our mission and a big part of our delivery strategy for the year was all around how can we deliver high quality work in happy and productive teams? So all those principles around trust, autonomy, collaboration and quality formed our roadmap for delivery success. And it did succeed. We were improving our sprint completions. We reduced our backlogs by something like 92%. We improved our cycle times, but most importantly, we're seeing positive trends in our health checks. Trust and team unity became the one factor that was constantly peak regardless of what was happening. And even to this day, it still remains the highest. So today we're now a tribe of over 40 people and the squads have really come into their own. We have seen the true impact of having one product manager and delivery to a squad and the positive effect it has on teams in self-organizing, making decisions and owning their work. Of course, we have teething issues every now and then, like every team, but they have really started to understand that this is part of our agile journey and that we need to improve and iterate all the time in order to make successes. My biggest learning for a tribe that goes through continuous growth and change is that it's okay to not do everything agile says. It's okay to have a mixture of different experiences and teams. Some may be agilists for the whole time, others may go through the whole cycle, but it's the mindset, the trust, and the acceptance of new learning and adapting continuously that makes it a success. And just the end note before I pass over to Claudia, if you asked me two years ago if I should be the only ad expert in the team, I probably would have said, yes, that's my role. But this whole journey has really led me to actually be that pioneer to encourage that thinking within my teams. It's about how we work and learn together. And that's how we can and have actually made Agile our bread and butter. Thanks, Maria. So following the tribe evolution, I'll take you through our latest squad to be formed at iTech and what that journey has looked like through the pandemic. March 2020, I think that's going to be a date that's ingrained in our heads forevermore. But I had been at iTech around six months in March of this year. 
when I was asked to set up a new pillar for the company. So for iTech, it was a shift away from the one-to-one -one relationship that the majority of iTech's squads and products have, that being one squad dedicated to one product. And those of you here today with agency experience in particular will likely be more familiar with the new setup that we shifted to, away from one-to-one -one and towards one-to-many. So one squad dedicated to many products. In this case, it was a roadmap of 10. We knew it would be a challenge because iTech hadn't taken on an, an approach like this before. So we not only had to deliver to targets, but also establish a sustainable roadmap to work towards. What we hadn't factored in was that we'd be kicking off in a global pandemic and we'd need to establish a brand new ways of working on top of everything else. So on day zero, our team looked like this. We had our Adjiner, someone who had worked with Jira before, but never with any agile ceremonies. Our Agiterate, someone who came across from another squad in iTech. So was familiar with ceremonies, but maybe not so much with the understanding behind them. And our Edge expert being the delivery lead. So as a team of three, we had to identify our purpose, which was to grow our products from sites with great potential to products making an impact in their markets. We had to define who we needed, which was a cross-functional team, as is the typical iTech product squad. But we added an, an additional layer onto that, leaning into the growth hacker element that you're not only an expert in your own field, but you're also looking for new opportunities and how we could grow quite quickly. And the three of us had to establish our ways of working. So <laughs> our agile ways of working that we agreed on between the three of us was we had stand-ups three days a week, not daily, two-week time box sprints, and comms mainly over our internal chat to avoid pulling people onto unnecessary Zoom calls. Now, just saying those now makes me cringe, but hindsight is wonderful. And we thought our work from home approach would be much more temporary than where we've ended up. Within a few months, we'd expanded to a team four times the size, splitting into two squads. And these squads had an awful lot going on. So we had continuous planning, initiatives were coming in and out of focus. We were switching priorities and trying to figure out what the best approach was for this. We didn't really have anyone to follow. We were continuously onboarding. Every second Tuesday, we had more people joining, at least one, um, be it an internal move or an external hire. And then also at iTech, we have the luxury that we're really encouraged to fail fast. So have an ideation, push up some sort of new feature, measure the impact, and then endorse or improve. So there was quite a lot going on for any squad. Um, but in fairness to this squad, we were hitting all of our targets. Everything looked great. And from a stakeholder point of view, we were doing really well. It wasn't until we started digging into our health checks data that we really started to see the gaps, particularly in communication, trust within the team, most of all, our ways of working. Squad members with all levels of Agile experience had been onboarded to a ways of working that was established when we were a team of three and when we thought permanent work from home was temporary. We'd been seeing great success with our initiatives that we hadn't recognized some key issues caused by the remote nature of the team. As we continued to expand in size, we hadn't revisited the workflow. We hadn't explained the why behind the ceremonies that we'd chosen to implement. And we hadn't heard about other squad members' agile experience and ideas. So despite our success metrics, we had a key missing ingredient, psychological safety. So as a squad, we took a step back, recognized the shift that the pandemic had brought and how quickly our squad had scaled in that time. The squad spent time workshopping to build the safety back encouraging squad members to challenge and adapt the processes based on both past experience and experience with the new work from home situation. We tried to identify individual values to then build up our team values and a team identity. And most importantly, we looked at how we communicate with each other. How do we like to give and receive feedback? How do we plan initiatives? Even adding comments to JIRA. The ways of working that we'd establish as a trio back in March 2020, <laughs> that was pulled apart and improved to suit our new squad and our new virtual norm. Now, most cross-functional squads will have varying level of agile experience and knowledge. That's to be expected, and I don't think that's a learning for anyone here. 
But a big learning for us was just because our team are performing against targets does not mean we've established ourselves to sustainably scale as a happy and high performing team. We needed to develop awareness within the squad that we care about more than the success metrics and ask the team, how's this work going for you? Are you seeing the benefits of our workflow? Then take action based on that. So I'll leave you with this. We decided on a team value and anyone who's read James Kerr's book Legacy will be familiar with this value, but we were borrowing from the All Blacks rugby team with the philosophy of no dickheads. The All Blacks are the best in the world, not due to being bigger, stronger, or having the most funding, but they have an innate respect for the team they play with, the game they play, and the country they're representing. They each hold a deep belief that no one is bigger than the team and individual brilliance does not automatically lead to outstanding results. So how do we loop this squad formation in a pandemic back into learning the language of Agile? If you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, ask it. If you agree with the why, challenge it. And as a squad of all varying levels in this new normal, we'll decide what to do, but each voice in our squad is always respected. Whether you're an Agineer, an Agiterate or an Ag expert, you play a part in defining the agile ways of working and ultimately the success of your squad. So now to sum up some key takeaways from today's talk, agile workflows are not just for delivery. All members of the squad should have a voice. We're always continuously learning and adapting irrespective of the size or age of the squad or tribe. No one size fits all. Some teams require a bit more time to come around to the new ways of working. Invest time to understand the why behind what we're doing. Don't just take targets as an indicator, check in with your team and take action as required. Your squad are your most valuable asset. Invest time in them. And above all else, we should have fun when doing it. So now, over for questions. Thank you, um, Marie and Claudia. Really, really interesting to hear about the, the, the formation of the tribes, especially um, the largest tribe that you've got. So um, we've, we've um, because we're running slightly over, we've probably only got time for one question. So what I will say is um, if you've got any additional questions, um, my colleague Beth is going to um, put the um, Slack channel um, in the, the comment section so you can ask further questions on there. But um, I'll, I'll ask it. Um, I'll put a question to you from Ed, who who says, I found people who know Agile become blockers uh, using it effectively because they think the Agile manifesto is gospel um, as a framework. Do you encounter this and how do you overcome it? Yep, I can probably look at this off. So we do have the same, um, especially in the tribe. And what we actually did is that we kind of twisted the manifesto for ourselves and we kind of formed our own one but with the team so it wasn't something that we were saying this is our manifesto we kind of got everyone on board and we shaped it together and we found that by doing that everyone was invested in it and they all wanted to be part of the evolution of what we did moving forward cool. and we probably can squeeze one last question in from Oren. so he says um do your product teams often run into roadblocks where they depend on other product teams in, in the business to make changes for you to be able to complete those changes um i think there's quite a lot of cross collaboration in itech um and a lot of like sharing knowledge between them i think some of the main roadblocks that we'd come from are probably more from like our structural bases and um, things like hosting or um, issues that we're running into with that and something like that we we as a delivery chapter tend to come together um, and try to brainstorm around that in ways that we can help them out but there is quite a lot of collaboration between all the squads if one squad is feeling it or one tribe is feeling it it's probably going to be across the company so yeah Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. And obviously, it was, it was really good to hear about the delivery function at iTech and especially um, how you guys have been coping during during the lockdown and, and hearing about how, how your largest tribe has, has formed and, and how that's doing. So thank you very much. Um, so the next talk, um, we've, we've got Rosalyn, um, who's um, at Zoopla, and, and she's going to be telling us a little bit more about the delivery function or where she works. Thank you very much. Hi, hello everybody, um, and thanks very much to Maria and Claudia. It's really interesting um, hearing about what's going on at iTech, and there's definitely some similarities with what I've been experiencing in Zoopla. So, um, yeah, I'm Roz, and I head up the delivery function in Zoopla. And before I jump into talking about 
how we're measuring our delivery function. I wanted to set a little bit of context about where Zoopla was a year ago. So Zoopla has a huge ambition to reimagine intelligent home decisions for all. And they've been giving a lot of investment into their product and tech teams, scaling the number of teams that they have and um, bringing in more engineers, more product managers, data analysts, designers. However, a year ago, a critical piece of this puzzle was missing and there was no dedicated delivery function. And what that meant was that delivery responsibility fell within the teams. Um, and it was meaning that for product managers, they were spending a lot of their time very introverted and inward focused within the teams, not being able to find that balance between thinking about the strategy, the future, stakeholder engagement and working with design and kind of gathering insights. And for engineers, what that meant is whilst everybody was responsible for delivery and continuous improvement, nobody was accountable for it. Um, and so you had individuals and teams pulling in different directions, focusing in different areas. They were finding the same solutions to the same problems and not sharing that knowledge. So I started working with Zoopla about a year ago and I was the first delivery person in through the door. And at that time, there were about 10 teams that were all contributing to a pretty critical deliverable for Zoopla. And so I started to support all of those 10 teams. And you can probably imagine how badly that went and how quickly my time was just swamped. So fairly rapidly, we bought, I brought in an additional three delivery managers who we managed to embed in with some of the critical teams and start supporting them from the inside to grow their delivery capability and bring that, that focus to the ways of working. And so what I started to do was think about how we can start measuring the impact that delivery was having and building the business case for why Zoopla needed to invest in this and bring in a greater delivery function to support the teams to deliver effectively. So when I talk about a delivery function, I see its primary purpose as being everybody understanding what's important and being able to get on and doing it. And that delivery really puts in place the structures and support to lighten the team's load and make sure that they can deliver effectively. And that's particularly important in large organizations um, where there's a lot of dependencies, a lot of communication, a lot of cross-team collaboration and knowledge sharing. There's a lot of moving parts and delivery can really help bring alignment and take that pressure away from teams. And so I see that there's three areas of focus for delivery. Agile best practice being early and continuous delivery, iterative design and development, inspect and adapt mentality, reducing waste, all of those good things that I'm sure everybody on the call understands. Then we've got things around value delivery. So are teams able to focus on the most important things? Are they able to do just enough, just in time planning to respond to change and break work down? So when they start something, they're not immediately blocked or have to context switch or change. And then there's team cohesion. And that's really that X factor of bringing a group of individuals together to work collaboratively, to have good communication and to trust and support each other. And so when I started to think about how do we measure the impact that delivery was having within Zoopla, I started to think about how to measure these three areas. So thinking about measuring agile best practice, what I looked at here was something very similar to the Spotify models, because it's just uh, the Spotify health check, sorry, because it's just such a good format. And it's one of those things that I really wish that I'd managed to think of getting teams to red, amber, green on a list of questions. However, what I did here was go back to the Agile Manifesto and look at some of the principles that that sets out because it broadens out from purely the engineering focus and starts to think about things around being user-centered of having data and evidence-based decisions. And so what we're doing with teams within Zoopla is once a quarter getting them to have an Agile Principles retrospective and looking at those trends and seeing where the delivery team can help within the teams, put in the structures, support, drive the conversations for continuous improvement, but also take a step back and look across the board. Where have we got maybe some more systemic challenges to what 
what's going on in teams and how can our, we as a delivery team put things in place. So one of the measurements that we're using for delivery, measuring delivery function in Zoopla is seeing that positive trend and seeing a change in teams over time. What we're also doing with those agile principles is thinking about the team's mastery levels around these. And this is to really understand how much can teams independently execute on their agile best practice without the support of a delivery manager or another role that it may, might be individually championing those. And so getting teams over time to come out of the understand, grow and into the practice lead evangelize where they're actually taking responsibility, challenging each other and holding each other to account for the agile best practice and their ways of working. And so one of the other measurements that we're looking at within delivery um, for Zoopla is seeing that positive trend over time of helping teams to build out these skills and practice this without delivery's dedicated support. Something else I'm really interested to see what happens over time is as teams' mastery levels increase, um, so too with the standard that they're holding themselves to. So at the moment, maybe the fact that a team can release once a fortnight at the end of a sprint, they see as like a really good achievement and they're quite happy because they're in the understand grow phase of agile best practice. But as their maturity levels build over time and they get into practice lead evangelize, I'd be expecting them to kind of start getting frustrated that they can't deliver on demand or um, more regularly. And so actually taking a step back to the Agile Principles retrospectives, will we start to see more amber and reds come in over time as teams mastery levels increase and they hold themselves and Zoopla to a higher standard? And then what can we as a delivery team do to make sure that Zoopla can always stay one step ahead and support teams to deliver um, in the most effective way. So then when I started to think about value delivery um, and think about the role of the delivery function within this. So within Zoopla, we're using OKRs, probably not much of a surprise. I'm afraid I can't share any actual examples um, because they're all relating to work that's happening at the moment. Suffice to say that it relates to property. And so thinking about the delivery functions role within these, I realized that it's, it's around how much focus, time and attention can a team give to achieving their OKRs? Are they masters of the work that are coming in or are they beholden to lots of requests and reactive work? And so through some Jira wizardry that I don't fully understand myself, what we're able to do is start looking at where is a team's focus going um, and how does that relate to the OKRs that they're trying to achieve? And this is really to drive that conversation within teams to understand, okay, well, you've achieved one of your key results, but not the other two. So does an effort need to start shifting within the team? Is that an indication that maybe the team are gold plating um, or they could be readjusting their, their focus? And then the other thing that this is driving within teams is that other work that comes up within every team. So I'm never expecting all teams to be able to give 100% focus to OKRs. It's just not achievable. But what this is doing is driving greater awareness within the teams of not just what they're working on, but how and why they're working on it. How does it relate up to the wider strategy? And what's the prioritization of the other work that they're doing um, in relation to achieving their OKRs? And so this is a measurement that we're using within Zoopla to drive that conversation with teams of what's the most important thing um, and how do they know? What we're also looking at as a measurement for delivery is around the achievement of OKRs. So are teams able to achieve what they're setting out to do? Within Zoopla, we're not using uh, moonshot or stretch goal OKRs. We're trying to get teams to accurately forecast and predict what impact they realistically think they can have within a quarter. Now, as I said, we're quite new to using OKRs and definitely what we're seeing at the moment is a lifetime's worth of ambition going into a quarter's worth of OKR. So we're seeing teams at the moment kind of going back in changing that target as they start to appreciate what they can really achieve in a quarter and 
whilst I know that there are a lot of people out there that, you know, OKRs shouldn't change, I'm seeing this as a really positive sign of teams starting to understand and mature their awareness of what they can achieve each quarter. So again, over time, as we measure the impact of delivery, I'm expecting to see a, a more accurate correlation between what teams set out to do and what they're actually able to achieve. And then another way that we're measuring the, the value delivery side of the impact that the delivery function is having is by driving that team's stability, predictability, and flow. And this is something that um, Maria and Claudia just mentioned that really resonated with me, of teams understanding what their workflow is. So this isn't about getting all teams to deliver 30 story points in a given sprint. Um, the teams in Zoopla can choose how they want to work, if they're Scrum, if they're Kanban, if it's three weeks, two weeks. It's down to the teams to understand the context um, and the environment that they're delivering within. However, getting team stability, predictability, and flow is all about getting graphs that look something like the one on the left to look more like the one on the right. And so how can we, how can teams better understand their workflow so they're not picking up a piece of work and then immediately becoming blocked because they need to talk to another team or they didn't understand the definition of ready? And what role is delivery playing in driving that conversation and helping teams find that stability in their work? And what this is doing is really driving that sustainable delivery in teams so that when they say that they can achieve something, they're not going to be burning out to try and achieve it or continuously missing goals and then um, feeling bad and kind of like the, the morale in the team lowers. So then finally thinking about team cohesion and how to measure this. And this is the one that I struggled with the most because it's really taking something that is very qualitative and subjective and trying to put a quantitative measure around it. So I'm currently working with our HR team to get insight into some of the staff surveys and team temperature checks that we have to understand what are the underlying themes that continuously come up that delivery can start to impact but I've been reluctant to put a KPI or a measurement for the delivery team around that because it's not fully within our um, control. 2020, I think, has proven that there are many different factors that impact our mindsets when we're at work. And so assigning a, a measurement to the delivery function of increasing staff satisfaction by X feels a little bit outside of purely our control. But we're starting to work with HR to understand how can we measure um, the happiness and the health of people at work and what can delivery do to that. So for team cohesion at the moment, we're returning back to those agile principles retrospectives because there's definitely indicators in there that go to the team happiness, trust and support, empowerment. And we're looking for those positive trends over time. And then, as I say, we're also working with HR on some of those things behind the scenes. So one example that's come up a lot for Zoopla this year is because there's been a lot of recruitment and a lot of interviewing, there's a real fatigue and burnout that's happening. And so what delivery managers have been able to do in teams is first and foremost, within the teams that have got a lot of people involved in interviews, work out how, how that balances out to their day-to-day -day team involvement. Are there adjustments that need to be made? Is there additional support that can be given to people while they're in the quite intensive process of interviewing? And then also behind the scenes, we've been able to look at, well, what's the overall spread of responsibility with interviews? And how can we make sure that everybody's being called on evenly and it isn't falling to a few? And so that's one of the impacts behind the scenes that we're starting to have on team cohesion and morale within Zoom. So this is the summary of the KPIs that we're using to measure the delivery function. Um, and what we're already seeing, so we're still baselining these and kind of working out where our bench where our benchmark needs to be. But we're definitely already starting to see that positive trend. So we don't have delivery managers working with all the teams, but for the teams that do have delivery support, we're starting to see that positive trend through. The Agile principles retrospectives are already starting to come through um, as teams have a, a, a focal point for their continuous improvement. And they're starting to feel empowered to make the changes that they need to, to improve their delivery processes. Um, we're also starting to see the conversations around OKRs coming in. Teams are asking why they're working on things, what's the most important thing, um, and what, what is achievable to them so that they're setting realistic goals. 
Team stability, predictability, and flow. I, I don't think we're quite on the, uh, the flatlining graph at the moment, but again, we're starting to see that that curve um, come down a little bit, and we're starting to see a bit more stability as teams understand um, their processes and their workflows. And the agile principles, the mastery levels, we're still working on that and figuring out what the right baseline should be. But what that has meant, seeing the positive trend with the teams that have got delivery support, is that it's helped us build the business case in Zoopla to invest in a permanent delivery function. So what's going on today? Zoopla still has um, the ambition to reimagine intelligent home decisions for all, and it's still um, doing a lot of recruitment um, and growing and investment in product and tech. Um, however, whereas delivery was a missing piece of the puzzle last year, it's now viewed as integral to Zoopla's overall success. And so we've recently recruited a team of 10 delivery managers to support the teams within Zoopla with their effective delivery. And what that's starting to see, and what the benefits we're starting to see from that is that rebalancing with the roles of the product managers. So they're very much still embedded in within the teams there to support the day to day, but they're finding that shift to be able to think about the longer term strategic work, um, to do the stakeholder engagement, to get the data and the insight into what the most important longer term problems are for the teams to be solving. And then for engineering, what that's meaning of having a dedicated delivery manager is that whilst everybody is still responsible for delivery and for effective ways of working, um, it's one person is now accountable for driving that conversation and is really a focal point within the teams. And delivery managers are able to connect the dots. So if there is best practice or things that teams that's helpful to share across teams, delivery managers are able to start seeding that and getting teams to work more collaboratively and share. So um, what I'm hoping to see over time is that as delivery managers are embedded within teams, we're able to really build that business case and show the benefit of the teams. I'd like to think that that isn't always at the expense of being able to compare the teams that don't have delivery managers to the ones that do. Um, but for now, it's showing a very interesting kind of like test case um, of the of a control case of teams that haven't changed. So I hope it's been helpful sharing how we're measuring the delivery function within Zoopla and building the business case for establishing that permanently. And I'd be really interested to hear from anybody that's using some other metrics to measure the impact of delivery um, or has any other suggestions because my thinking is definitely continuing on this. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Rosalind. Re really interesting talk and um, yeah, re really interesting to, to see how the delivery function has, has been established and, and, and how it's been operating over the last few few months and uh, especially during the, these trying times over the last few months. So yeah, I just thought um, I'd, I'd open it up to the to the other panellists. appreciate we've, we've not heard from you. For, um, so um, James, I was just wondering if, if you had any um, questions you'd like to ask um, Rosalind um, on, on the delivery function at Zupa. Um, no, I mean, to be honest, one of the things you were speaking about in terms of getting those graphs to look more like stable rather than up and down, I'm going to talk about a little, something that kind of impacted our graphs to do exactly that. So I hope that uh, my conversation will at least give you maybe a bit of an insight into how I've done that. But I thought that was really, I think, um, what I'm personally seeing more and more across like a lot of the Agile talks in the last year is that the team cohesion seems to be more and more important especially as people talk about it. I wonder if you um, could maybe talk about how you kind of sometimes selling that people have to feel happy can be quite difficult in those kind of like to senior stakeholders conversations. How have you kind of handled putting team cohesion as one, you know, one of those three things? Yeah, it's interesting. I think one of the lucky, um, we've been quite lucky within Zoopla because nobody's really questioned the integral value of working in an agile way of, well, I don't think any organization would argue against delivering value and that creating an environment of support, trust and, and motivation gets the best work out of people. So Zoopla already does a lot to invest in its people anyway. So I think that's maybe been a little bit of an open door for us. Um, but I think it's it's also about moving away from that notion that everybody has to be happy and people can just bring themselves 
to work um, and it's okay to be having a bad day. It's okay to be struggling, um, particularly in 2020. And it's about how do the team rally around each other and support each other, that that's the, the X factor that it's really difficult to measure um, because it's, yeah, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. And uh, Claudia and Maria, um, do, do you have any questions you'd like to, to put to Rosalind? I was like uh, trying to let Maria go. Um, no, I think uh, I think in general, just when you're talking about kind of team health and everything, that's something that we have only really dug into in the last year, and we've seen it have such a good impact um, in that in making sure that, like I said, we're not just hitting targets or not hitting targets, but digging into the why behind it. Um, and it's probably, I think, from what you're saying, Zufla's probably quite early in that journey, but. Um, I'd be really interested to kind of pick that up as well and just kind of talk through how how we did it and how maybe um, you guys could adapt it as well. Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, yeah, just um, one quick question from um, Septina, then we'll uh, move on. So she, um, um, they ask again, um, do you have a portfolio function within the delivery? No, we don't. Um, so delivery is only operating within the product and tech teams at the moment. So we haven't needed to get into a kind of a portfolio. Um, and there's there's never been a, a more traditional PMO function within Zoopla either. So we've had quite a, a blank slate of delivery coming in um, and being able to support teams with agile structures and processes rather than the, the more traditional or waterfall ones that can come out of a, a portfolio function. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Rosalind. Um, much appreciated for obviously um, for, for speaking with us, and, and really interesting to hear how how the delivery function has been operating uh, at Zoopla. Um, so finally, we've we've got um, James, um, who's who's going to be telling us more about um, the delivery function at, at Discovery. So I'll, I'll let you um, explain more. Hi. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Sometimes coming off mute on AirPods is a bit interesting. Um, I hope that's fine. Uh, so yeah, um, thanks for the introduction. So uh, when I found out I was going to do a bit of a talk, I thought the first thing you have to do is come up with a really catchy title that's ambiguous that draws people in. So I call it predicting the unknown. And this is about how estimating bugs leads, leads to improved delivery. Uh, first of all, I'll jump a little bit about me. Uh, I've since dyed my hair since this last photo. But generally, I'm a, I'm a pinky purple glittery person. My background is in a mixture of e-commerce and VOD. So I started off with Salmon, doing working with brands like Ted Baker, Next, and Netta Porter. Moved on to do some global logistic operations for a company called Goblix. I then started my own kind of mobile app startup and ran that for a while before moving back into e-commerce, working with Liquitex, Snazaroo, and Windsor and & Newton, um, which are like really big art brands. And then moved over to Osmodern, which is a VOD um, platform, CMS, that supported the, you know, the launches of Equinox, their online platform, Skies, project in New Zealand, and working with the TV Academy. Uh, so like doing the Emmy Awards, that was really fun. And I'm relatively new at Discovery. Uh, so I've only been at Discovery for about six weeks now, kind of bringing the me to Discovery. I'm a poet. Uh, and Discovery Plus, just as a little bit of a plug, Discovery Plus is out now on SkyQ. Uh, it's really cool. Check it out. Uh, so why do I love data and talk about data? Um, I think I always think it's interesting to know the people behind the data. Uh, and I've always liked solving problems, always been a bit into maths, a bit into physics. And then I went and did a psychology degree where basically you do like 60% books and 40% lots of interpretation of data with really advanced data skills. Um, so I kind of had data driven in me growing up. And then I also play music in a band. And at the moment, when you're doing music, data is just as important as music. So having an understanding of who your listeners are, when they listen, how to advertise against them, is just as important as actually having a good song. So you know, that, they're the kind of the drivers for data. And I still think there's a lot of value to be found in collating and analyzing the data. Uh, and personally, I'm always like, I like adding value. I don't really like just kind of doing a job to turn a two into a three. I like to be really involved and passionate. Um, and that's the background to that. So just some high level uses of data in agile projects. I'm sure people have seen stuff. So a common one is measuring the capacity, which is the velocity of story points. 
I've seen them used for measuring quality. I've seen them to be able to use for delivering, you know, roadmaps. This this roadmap feels like a native story point, so let's map that. And predicting the unknown, which is what I'm going to talk about, which fundamentally is story pointing bugs. Um, I apologize in advance. This The rest of this kind of assumes that the audience here would know uh, story points. If not, um, please feel free to put in the chat and I can do a little bit of a summary of that. But fundamentally, everything from here on in is the concepts of story points. So what what kind of problem is this kind of trying to solve? So the situation that I found myself in across a couple of teams is that you have a development, and I also I like Bugs Life as a film. So talking about Bugs, I've just got a load of screenshots from Bugs Life. Hopefully you've seen Bugs Life and will follow along. Uh, that's just a little bit of me. So the development team are estimating work using story points. And often then the delivery manager or scrum master is measuring the velocity normally to try and assess the capacity of the team, what you want to put into a sprint or a period of four weeks if you're doing Kanban. And what we often found is that the same development team that fix, fixes the bugs is working on new features. And then those bugs both vary in the amount you get a month and also the complexity. So basically when they works works alongside, the bugs are not story pointed, but the story points are. And even though you're spending effort on bugs, and you kind of get an up and down graph, a little bit like what Ross was speaking about before. So how does that look and impact? I wish I had a graph that looked like Ross's. I think if I ever do this again, it'll look like that. But so then what happens is a delivery manager says, oh, you know, our velocity in X period was 50 story points. And we only had one bug in that period. So the team will say, oh, okay, you know, well, let's commit to 40 story points because the bugs always take up some of our time. And, you know, that, may, that way we've got space to work on any bugs that come up. And then what happens, you know, if three big bugs pop up and it's difficult to assess the impact of those, you know, obviously if they're P0s, P1s, you know, drop everything, the website's down, checkout doesn't work, you can't play content in Italy, you know, all those kind of things come up um, without, with just, with just a fix it attitude, with no ability to quickly assess the impact of that to delivery. So then what you get is like the bugs take longer than expected in verbal communications, how long will it take, take a little bit of time? So the bugs take longer than expected and the team actually delivers 35 points. And then you kind of get this impact where the product team starts to lose confidence and tech's ability to deliver a little bit. And then team morale drops when the team sees a little bit of a dip in the graph and they wonder why it's not. And is it them? And it doesn't help, that kind of stuff. And then what usually happens is you start the cycle again. So you hope for less bugs last time, maybe we can manage it a little bit better. Maybe you look at the you know support process, but you kind of leave in a lot of places, you kind of leave the fact that the that unknown work is unknown. So how do have I been solving it? Basically, story pointing bugs. Um, and I know it goes against a lot of the philosophy of some stuff. Uh, hopefully, I'll convince you by the end of this presentation that it's worth doing. So you do the same story as you still do the same process as estimating stories. And yes, some bugs are vague and some have more detail and the solution is clearer. You'll have bugs that says, websites down why although in my experience normally at that point there's it, there's a really clear re reason why that's down and you've got to do some work and some is the logo in the top right is too big or on safari it you know the bug on the player goes over too much so actually you, it's very similar to level of uh, scope to a normal story just perhaps you don't have the designs nice and maybe the acceptance criteria isn't as fleshed out so you really estimate the bugs to the best of the team's knowledge at the time, and then you you work as normal. You know, so after the first couple of times, you know they they can see what is a big, small, and large bug. Um, so while that happens, until you've got the data, you kind of just need to keep track. And what I would be doing is I then make vis visible the average size of the bug, the average amount of bugs that we're getting a month, and then the show the variance between the big and the small. So when someone says this feels like a really quick bug or this feels like a really big bug, you can start to have some actually quantitative estimates of what that should look like. Um, and then you've got to give it time. It seems to be, in my experience, two to four months, depending on how many tickets you get through. Uh, but that seems to be the sweet spot where the data starts to be looking you know, about right. And when you introduce this to teams, there are obviously a little bit of concerns, mainly because most people have been heard don't story point bugs. And um, you get, we don't know how to solve this. So how can I estimate it? And there's often there's a line of 
You know, there's enough detail by the time it's got to a bug to probably know that and you embrace the ambiguity. There's no other option but to embrace the ambiguity. You also maybe hear, we haven't got time to estimate this, it's a P0. While there may be some merit in that, I think often it doesn't take more than a minute to like estimate a quick, or put a quick estimate on a bug. Um, and that can really help You know, a lot of the, the, I think you'll see the value pays off just for doing that. Will this data be used to punish me? You know, I'm sure you've heard this with using story points for teams. No, you know, it's not about, you know, you've only, you solve bugs slower than that. It's none of that kind of stuff. Um, it's all about just getting the right capacity. And every now and again, if you've got a really good team morale, they, and everyone's a bit stressed, you know, they might have that one person who makes a quick joke. It's a story point, that Fibonacci thing. And if you get that nine times out of 10, they're just trying to wind you up. They're just trying to wind you up. So, um, and if not, you could always quickly refresh. And um, I've done a couple of refreshes with teams that takes 10 to 15 minutes. So it's normally not too bad. So then you, um, so what's the, like when you come to doing the data analysis and story points, what do you do? So I don't know if everyone's aware, but there's a brilliant free add-on called Jira for Google Sheets. And it basically just does a pull of all your Jira data for free into Google Sheets, which means you can basically play with it like Excel, which is great. So in our scenario that we're creating up, the data would show that the average bug raised was a three and the variance between that was like a two and, and the big ones were fives. So we kind of had an idea that then the small bugs were twos, an average bug was a three, and anything that's a big bug would be a five. We also saw that the team had an average of four bugs a month to deal with, give or take. Um, and therefore, we know it's likely that we have to make space for four bugs in next month. Or, you know, if you're doing next sprints or however you'd like to arrange your work, but you know the space you can then make for that. You're predicting the unknown. Um, so, then, so then what happens now in, in the solution-wise is then the delivery manager is reporting the velocity is increased to 65. Because what you're now doing is you're still putting your, your bugs. You expect a bit of an increase in velocity. So the team says, okay, well, we know that we're going to have, probably have to have a few bugs, so we'll commit to 53 points, and that means that the bugs that, we, that are probably going to come up, we can have space to work on and still hit that kind of 65 velocity and keep a nice flat graph um, in an ideal world. Uh, another throwback to Ros. hope that's okay. Um, so then what happens is, in this scenario, three big bugs are raised. So we go, well, okay, thanks for raising them. We'll get the team set on them. We think this is going to be 15 points. So I've been lucky enough to always work with a product owner. So you've got three more points that you need to take out basically. So you can very quickly in the same conversation say, all right, okay, which ticket comes out of there? What can we live with? Um, and then they can escalate to the, sh to the stakeholders, the impact. So, you know, very quickly that they can say, well, we had a big outage yesterday. We know it's gonna be about 15 points. Therefore this one story isn't gonna get done, but we're letting you know a week in advance rather than the day before. Um, and what happens is the team delivers the points and the retro feedback set comes down to some bugs being super big. So you kind of get that feedback loop again. And then, you know, just to continue that, so what we found is then, then the conversation doesn't become, oh, there's been a big drop in velocity. You actually get like the team morale normally like get bounced together and rises and becomes like, yeah, do you remember that bug? Oh yeah, well, you can see it in the data. Look at that spike. That's because we dealt with three big bugs or whatever. You can have those kind of conversations with the team. Um, it helps the product team to clearly understand the reasons for delays. You know, I think as the product team kind of matures, depending on who you've got, um, not everyone understands that like, bugs are probably going to be raised. Those things take time and they have complexity. So that when, when they're part of that decision and they can really clearly see what the impact of bugs are quickly, it helps them make decisions, uh, at least have the ability to make decisions as the bugs arise. And now when setting deadlines and planning roadmaps, we don't kind of have to just add 10% contingency or always kind of plan for bugs. We can predict the unknown and we can plan for it. Um, and we can, as a, as a result, dates tend to become more realistic. The roadmap becomes deliverable. Uh, and that's because you've now got, when you estimate bugs, you've kind of got a true vision on capacity. Whereas before they were a little bit hidden with bugs. Now you've got a true vision of that and you kind of know where you are. And there's less last minute panic, tends to be less stress stress, and certainly less forced overtime because you, you're normally tracking a burn down. You can make the decisions often quickly enough so that by the time any really hard deadlines get there, you've normally been able to escalate early enough. Um, and this is generally team, good for both teams 
and the stakeholders. So like impact is the projects that I had. So I first tried this idea and went on a project that was dealing with a lot of bugs and a lot of stories and it landed on the deadline day and it tracked pretty closely to the burn down all the way through. And we found that you know, as bugs arose, the product would constantly prioritize him. So I, I, I feel like there was more reprioritizing as a result of this and more prioritizing with context of what they need to deliver, you know, both bought for and after launch. And it was really good that if we look, if dates looked like they were slipping, we could discuss it knowing the unknowns. And may, and I think at one point we said, right, if any bugs come up in the last two weeks, we need another team to handle these totally. Because even though they might be slower, we won't hit our deadlines. You know, we, could, we could have those conversations. And then since this, I've done another four project deadlines at two different companies. And they landed on time using this approach. And that's both across e-commerce and VOD. So I don't think it's like a domain specific. Uh, it looks to me like once you kind of teach the devs and everyone gets comfortable with the approach, it kind of make that variance gets thinner, which is really good. And I don't know whether I'm just really lucky, but the teams that we've done this in seem to be really happy, really high performing, always getting a lot out of it. And interestingly, and a retro action was us was to show more data and to regularly discuss this in the start of our retros. So since then, the first five minutes of the retrospective is us looking at the, a really quick data snapshot of where we are, what we're doing. And the questions that get asked of that are really interesting. Um, you know, so like, how can I do this? What is that? And it's just, it depends on your team, but it's really quite interesting. Uh, certainly for me as a data, bit of a data nerd. And what the, the most shocking thing that I found was the wider business impact. So I was running a team, the team bought into the methodology, you know, we'd had all this, doing all the user ceremonies, all the feedbacks. But, and while database decisions became the norm for delivery, what was interesting is that the language traveled through to the product and the account management teams. So all of a sudden, because we were showing that the data could be predicted and delivered and the team was happy, and I think the comments were things like, you know, that team always looks happy, they always seem to deliver. You know, everyone else started saying, well, what, what data do we have that we can use? How can we adapt that kind of stuff? Which is really, which I, a little bit of a shock to me, but I thought it was really good. Um, and the product found that roadmaps could be put together with a lot more reasonable amount of confidence and the more planning than just adding 10%. Um, and then the impact of bugs was, to delivery dates was clearly shown. So I think at one point we had a project and some, the client moved the deadline back by a month due to we were solving bugs. And we were able to say, well, yeah, if we do 20 bugs, it's going to take this amount of time. And that was really helpful. Um, and also QA used it to make strong arguments for new tools to say, well, if we have less bugs, then we can maybe re reduce the impact by this. I'm not a QA lead. I don't fully remember all the in insights that they had. But basically, the QA lead was able to do some really cool stuff and make a strong argument for investing in new, new tools. Um, and yeah, fundamentally, it helps the product to understand what can not can and can't be delivered and why. So it kind of smooths out those lines a little bit. So if you're looking for a cheat sheet on how to predict the unknown, um, the biggest thing I could recommend is the free Jira Clouds for Sheets Google. Uh, it's not as easy to say as it is to read. The Jira Cloud for Sheets Google Sheets integration. And you do that and make a couple of pivot tables, make a couple of graphs, and they update in real time. So you're constantly getting that information and make it as visible as you can, as early as you can. Um, so try and do it in re at least in retros. And you have to embrace the ambiguity of the bug. So yes, it's not going to be a perfect story. Yes, there will be you know potentially wide variances at first in the bugs, but I think you just got to embrace that. And one of the really important things is make sure there's a feedback loop to the development team. You know they need to see the bugs, the impact of the data. Hopefully become inquisitive and ask why they do this, and understand that all this is to protect them. If we fully know their capacity. We can make sure that they're happy, they work on the right kind of things, they're not overworked, the, re the requests of them are realistic, and, and when the requests of them are stretching, we can acknowledge that and put things in place to help them. Um, and then you kind of end up going a little bit wild and you start using data to just drive, to drive as many decisions as you can. So you go delivery dates, then you look at quality, then you want your road mapping, then you wonder whether your on call support could benefit that to, you know, to balance out, and the list goes on you know, anyway. I'm sure you can imagine using data, you know, perhaps in your story point, this one or two things might stand out to you. Um, but yeah, and that's the little flick of the animation. It feels like a very proud cheat sheet. So yeah, has anyone got any questions?
There you go. Thank you for having me. Hopefully that's been clear. <laughs> Thanks, James. Really, really appreciate that and, and some, some interesting points that, that you raised. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've got um, a, a question from, from Sonic. Um, great username. Um, he says, how do you treat banks and does the complexity points on a bug cover the time it takes to research it? What was that again? Sorry, I missed the first bit. No worries. So he says, how do you treat spikes and does the complexity point on a bug cover the time it takes to research it? Yeah, I think they're two good questions. So spikes, I wouldn't story point. Um, they are the last little bit of variance that you could do. I guess if you wanted to take this to its nth degree, you could story point spikes. Um, that would be an interesting concept. I'm sure some developers could do that. And in the story point, I personally believe that when you story pointing, when you adjust for QA, it's for that QA you fail back and forth that's in the, in the one ticket, not for any future things that come in, because um, basically it just doesn't help make decisions really. There's too much ambiguity for that point. So if you, although you have to change your thinking a little bit, if you say, oh, this might go back and forth between QA and in progress a few times, all right, that's probably a higher point. But then anything new comes in is new work, Often the developer won't have just finished working it. It's 15 minutes to sit and understand it. It's got to, you know, get check out, blah, blah, blah. There's enough effort in that that they should be story pointed to, in my opinion. Cool. Hope that answers um, the question. Yeah. Um, we'll, um, we'll open it up to, to the other panelists if, if they have any, any questions they'd like to ask. Um, we'll, we'll go with uh, Rosalind first. Do, do you have any questions you'd like to ask James? Um, yeah, you touched a little bit on um, what the. QA on the team was doing with the data to kind of get the better tools. Was there anything that the team were using the data for as well to sort of reflect on what was causing the bugs and improvements to the processes, ways of working? And alongside the data, yeah, we would, we were also doing the Spotify health checks things at the same time. So you kind of look at it all as one big picture. Um, but I think the team were mainly interested in work because we were when we had a few new people who you were training in, what is a story point, why you do it, why do we have these estimation sessions? It helped them really see that, you know, a couple of the times we were pushing back on clients to say, we haven't got capacity and we know this because here's our four months of capacity and we estimate nearly everything that goes into it. And they and they saw the value of that and felt a bit more protected maybe. And although, though that never really came out, that would be my guess, they felt protected from that. Um, and it was certainly, maybe I was lucky enough to work with really good engaging high performer teams, but that certainly seemed to be in that kind of vibe to me. Thanks. And yeah, but fi finally, we'll go to um, Claudia and Maria, if, if they have any questions I'd like to ask James. Yeah, I've got one. Thanks, James. That was um, really great. It actually kind of resonates because it was only recently that I was having a similar conversation with some new engineers about why we estimate um, story point bugs. I guess, um, as you mentioned, like their plan and your team, it kind of helps boost the team morale to know they know what's coming in and you can prioritize. Has there ever been a case where like you've had a red ship that's come in that exceeds the story points that you've planned for and how the team kind of, I guess, adapt to that? Um, nothing that stands out, I'm afraid. I wish I had a story that I could tell. Um, I guess the biggest thing would be like the examples where you kind of have three, I think we had three P0s in one day at one point, and that obviously just hits you hard. Um, and that was where the tickets had to be a bit re reprioritized, but nothing to the point of like, uh, we thought this was a two, it's actually a 13 that we haven't already raised. You know, the team were quite good at when they found twos, they would kind of, you know, very quickly in, in the in progress, if they believed it was an eight, not a two, they would change it, we'd you know, speak to us and change it. And then we'd make it, you know, again, re simple as, refresh tab all the dashboards update with that jira clouds thing and then you've got an instant view really quickly cool thank you it's all right um just before we go to to um a few final questions i just wanted to, yeah. to pass to claudia if she had any questions she'd like to ask um yeah thank you i my main thing is for your success rate that you've had which is pretty impressive how experienced have don't you, jinx, don't jinx it. Don't jinx it. Um, <laughs> how experienced are your teams who are doing this because it's something that like my team are very new we haven't fully embraced story points yet um but have your teams been really experienced and also are they all are they fully engineers or are they cross-functional teams so the teams lot for these data were largely 
front end and back end as different people. So not like the full stack, I guess. Uh, and uh, what was the other, the other part of the question was, uh, oh, experience. I would say generally on your criteria, they're probably a mixture of uh, <laughs> ad spurts, sorry, and ad immediates, whatever. So I guess maybe maybe one person, maybe one or two were kind of new, where I think the concept of story points was new to most people in this scenario. So story points was a ground up, so I had the ability to shape that. But in terms of working in an agile way in sprints and delivering and kind of knowing that a Jira ticket is an item of work, yeah, generally I would say the team was, if I had to make it a split, probably 10% newbies, okay. 20%, 30% at the agile immediate, and then whatever the remaining percentage is, my maths has gone, whatever that remaining percentage is, is the experts. Great, thank you. And just just to finish off, um, James, we, we just got some some questions from from the comment section. So, apologies if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, Gregorio um, says, "How does um, team capability and stability affect bug story points?" I think it, it can do. Um, obviously, if team stability in terms of people coming in and out of the project, um, it does affect the story points in terms of getting everyone on the same page. What I've I've look, I'm very lucky in the, at Discovery, I've been able to analyze some big, big data. So in the past where I've been kind of talking about two to 300 data points, because of this pure size of Discovery, I've been able to look at four to 5,000 different data points. And the, the, the variance isn't as big as you'd think to worry about. It's, it's all like, you know, you've got a bigger chance of someone getting a cold, throwing out your points than that kind of stuff. So although, although it probably does, not negligible enough to change anything plans or change an approach. And I think team capability certainly does, but I would believe that's part of my role is to assess the team capability and to communicate it. You know, I'm not going to tell anyone how to suck eggs, I think is the expression, but at the same time, make sure that we're all on the same page or if they need to, then we, you know, I've had like sessions where you have to sit everyone down and say, right, okay, you know, we're going to do a story point exercise now. How many story points do you spend in meetings a day? And everyone kind of starts thinking in this concept and within 10, 15 minutes, you find the consistency in those planning poker stuff comes out. So um, you have to understand the team's capability, but to do enough of the basic training, if you're kind of experienced in that kind of stuff, isn't a large process. Probably a day and two or three weeks of just being consistent. The hardest bit from team capability side is just being a bit like, like not like the timesheet police, but for story points. Oh, can you add a story point to this? Oh, can you add a story point to this? For like the two weeks until that feedback loop of the data comes through, it is a little bit pulling teeth at times. But when once they see it and see the data and see that you're talking to the senior stakeholders using that data to protect them, they they kind of get it from that perspective. Cool. Uh, and last two questions, and um, before we wrap up, two um, questions. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I would, I would have got a bigger. Every, everybody's uh, yeah. Every, everybody's very very intrigued. Um, so um, how. Ed asks, how do you estimate uh, longer periods of work with story points? Um, and he says, for us, we go into lots of detail to provide points. Uh, just, I think in longer periods of work, um, we would split stuff out into epics and then kind of, I don't know about, so we'd split things. Also, no story should be bigger than an eight is we, one of the consistent rules. Um, and I think that the right level is about getting the right level of detail the, the thing that sticks out for me which sorry Ed, it's a bit of a rc answer but in that agile manifesto is like working stuff over comprehensive documentation so that word comprehensive really stands out to me where you know with the team we get the right level of detail that they feel like they need to work on stuff uh, and not over the verbose really but yeah we have epics split them down do a few planning sessions uh split into story points big sessions recently on a project at Discovery, I got everyone together for a day and we had the requirements and we spent about four hours breaking it down. But the per per benefit of that is I then built the dashboard, press refresh and was able to go to senior stakeholders straight away with insights about how this project was going to look, what the stuff there. And you know, so by doing it that way, you get quite a good insight. But it's certainly worth, worth doing the upfront time. I wouldn't change the upfront time, really. It's really good. That's kind of like five answers in one, Ed. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Feel free to reach out to us after and I'll try and, if I've got that wrong, I'll try and explain better. 
And final question from, from Julie. Um, she, she asks, um, have you ever worked in a company that had delivery dates driven by sales, i.e. the sales team are promising a client that a new feature will be delivered by X date without speaking to the product team first? Yeah, a little bit of that. Twice, Julie. Uh, once was in more like when I was doing agile logistics stuff, uh, which doesn't really have much merit here. And the second time was the Osmodin is like a design agency and they have aspects of that certainly and um, i don't think it's the sales teams are promising a client that a new feature it's kind of like the sales team are showing the roadmap and you have to there's just the communication line at the time between product roadmap and sales wasn't perfect um but as we went through this process we realized that what we were thinking was going to land in q2 next year actually had no chance of landing by q4 just because of the pure capacity of these kind of things um so I, I haven't worked in one purely driven by sales, but I guess I've worked in agencies that have contracts with delivery dates. So in that way, and and actually they found that when in the T&M concept of paying for sprints or whatever, they found the ability, they, were pay, they knew what capacity they were paying for was better for them than like, it might be 50, might be 35, might be 70. Who knows? Give us all your money. Great, thanks. Look at my new Porsche. You know, you could say, right, well, this probably gets you 60 odd points. It, we've got a product owner who's going to get what you think into that 60 bucket. It may be 63, it may be 58, but we'll be working on stuff for you. And you kind of have a lot less variance in that. Um, another long winded answer. I need to learn how to stop yeah. talking. But, but hopefully that helps, Julie. Uh, no, it does. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd just like to 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 extend um, TRG's thanks to to to, to Rosalind, to, to Claudia, to Maria, and and to James who who've um, given up the the Thursday evening to, to speak and, and elaborate a little bit more about the delivery function at each of their companies. And I'm sh I'm sure um, if you want to continue the the conversation and. Um, please do join our Slack group and, and I'm sure they'll be happy to to um, continue the conversation on, on LinkedIn as well. Um, so um, from from me and, and from our guests um, and speakers, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and yeah, thank you, everybody who's tuned in. And obviously, you guys make it what it is. So thank you very much. And next Agile event is on the 17th of December. We're squeezing one final one in um, before before the new year. So hope to, to see you there. So from me and from our speakers um a good evening and i uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your night cheers bye-bye see ya bye